Hello and welcome back to Sorted Food. It's been a while since we've done one of these. We've got two of our normals, Mike and Barry. We're going to feed them some potentially polarising, pretentious ingredients. Gentlemen, are your engines running? What? What? Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Lift und Klosch. Don Basil. It's always unidentified no, no, powder. No, 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 no. That, that looks like pollen or like, it's like a Szechuan bud. I was going to say that looks like ground up Szechuan buds. We are such pretentious foodies. <laughs> it tastes like dry Sambuca. Boys, what we have in front of you is dehydrated Sambuca. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, what is aniseed? It's, it's from a little star, isn't it? Taste friendly. It looks like a pollen. I'm hearing lots of interesting words, Evers. Most of them are correct. That is fennel pollen. Oh, oh God! What's the point in moving forward? We know everything. We know it all. So this is something that we've probably seen popping up for the last few years. It is a wonderful finishing ingredient to sprinkle over all sorts of dishes to give it that kind of earthy licorice note, the aniseed, but also kind of a bright zestiness, plus it's a nice colour. There is a citrusy note. There's a florality. Mm, sure. Yeah, you're welcome. Pretentious language. <laughs> that makes it not just a fashionable variation on something that already exists. It's gonna, it's gonna add something. I feel like it could. Food, please. Uh, whoa. What? Is that? That's a lot of mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> so what the food team have prepared for you are porchetta skewers, mashed potato, and charred cabbage. Oh! <laughs> Where is the potato in that? Because that is whipped butter. This is what happens when you get a chef to make mashed potato. That is stunning. As an aniseed -y product goes, I'm not a massive fan of the taste of aniseed, but here I get, you get more of the aromas than you do the taste. I quite like it. It's quite commonly used just to liven up veg dishes, from literally some, uh, some braised carrots or some cabbage. Um, wonderful in roasted root vegetable dishes. Can be used in baked things, so things like fennel cookies is a nice touch, but also on fish and pork and poultry. This is a product that's really tasty and it's nice. Personally, I don't know, I don't know if it's got that much of an impact to justify going out to buy yet another spice in a cupboard that I don't really fully maximise the use of. You've probably seen fennel as a bulb. It's essentially the same plant, but it is the wild version that's often foraged. At the right time of year, it flowers, you get wonderful fennel fronds, and then that becomes the, the flower and the pollen, and that is the bit that's harvested. This particular brand is harvested from Italy and is done so in the height of the summer by long generations of, of people who have gone out there in the early morning before the midday heat to capture that pollen at its best. Let's talk about cost. How much would you generally have in mind when buying spice jars? Somewhere between £1.50 and £2. And with that baseline in mind, how much do you think the wild fennel pollen is? Uh, £5 for that jar. £10. Fennel pollen can be bought in the UK at the moment for just over a thousand pounds a kilo, which makes that fifteen pounds fifty. Oh, that is pricey, isn't it? All of a sudden, I wish I'd harvested more of my fennel pollen last summer. <laughs> so, is it pretentious or not? I'm going to say it's not pretentious. I am going to say also, as a home cook, I could achieve something very similar using fennel fronds or. Yeah. frying off fennel spices and getting a similar experience. I think if you did standard fennel or fennel seeds, you'd get halfway there, but added with the zest of a lemon and perhaps a little bit of saffron, you'd kind of get all that collective element going on. If I was to get this out as a product at home, I've got to tell a story, we which therefore absolutely makes me it. even more pretentious, so I have to say it is a, it's a pretentious catalyst. Oh, oh that's a new category. <laughs> Should we move on to another dish? <laughs> yeah, quick. Lift the cloche. Uh, I trust this one less. Oh, that's it's yeah, got yeah, a it's got, it's got a shimmer, ball, it? a shimmer and a shake. Right, let's look at this up. Oh, I'm pretty sure it is something we have all eaten before, but not necessarily in this form. Gelatinous smooth peanut butter. 
Oh, I've got it in my nose. Oh, it's fishy. Oh, oh, it's the orange bit. We know we get a mussel and there's that little oh, yeah. or orangey bit on the side of it. It's that. The bits that I used to skeet around because I was scared of them, but actually delicious, it's that blended up. It's like a really smooth, subtle, fishy flavour. Yeah. It is a puree of sea urchin sex organ. Whoa! What, what sex organ do they have? Well, it's like they're gonads, basically, pureed up. <laughs> Sorry, it's sea urchin b <laughs> <laughs> This is an Italian product. It's used a lot in Japan but also across the Mediterranean, sort of Italy, some French cooking. I am sure. fascinated about how you use that in a dish. Oh, yes! Mixed feelings. We are going to learn some stuff oh. about ourselves and each other. <laughs> this is sea urchin beef tartar. Uh -huh. Got it with some very simple toasts, but it is already all seasoned up. That is absolutely stunning. I take everything that I said previously back. Wow. You know when you have mussels, you're like, I like the flavour, but I can't stand the texture, but I'll pretend I like it because it makes me look more grown up. And I also love garlic and cream. <laughs> this gives you that, that, that beautiful fishy flavour, but with the texture of meat, <laughs> which I'm much more comfortable with. That is great. And I think you hit the nail on the head there, but you said it's sort of mustily, and I think the first time I had it, it reminded me of like really intense mussel. It's got that sweet seafoody flavour, but also the salty, umaminess and then the texture which is almost buttery and creamy some people almost compare it to like the foie gras of the sea not in flavor but in texture and richness it's absolutely worldy in this situation here but realistically i am never ever going to make steak tartar at home here's a few ideas for you so 80 percent of sea urchin is consumed in japan and it is very much sashimi sushi the kind of dishes that we we had and loved when we were there but it's also used a lot in French and Italian cooking. So it could be passed through pasta. It can be added to mayonnaise or bechamel. It can be mixed through scrambled eggs. That feels like a really good way to elevate quite simple dishes. As a lot of these, I'm like, okay, I get it. I kind of get a couple of usage scenarios in pre-existing products I own that it could replace. Like yeah. oyster sauce, like fish sauce. Sure, gotcha. But is it going to change the dish that much? and it will probably change my bank account quite a lot. So that particular jar is 55 grams. How much do you reckon we paid for it? I'm going to say four pounds and 99 pence. I'm going to say 10 pounds again. <laughs> I think you should have just added them together. It's 14.99. This is what teamwork. teamwork. This is why sort of works so well, because really? I do my bit over here, you do your bit over here, and it comes together to make pure <laughs> magic. By accident. Sex organ. <laughs> 273 pounds per kilo. Again, you don't buy kilos of the stuff. So final question, pretentious or not? Again, I don't think it's pretentious. I think in the right hands, it's phenomenal. I'd, yeah, and I'd leave it at that because I wouldn't dare I'm not ready for try it. it at home. I'm not ready for it yet. Super interesting. How would you use it at home? Comment down below. Lift the cloche, see if you change your mind about this one. Uh, now what? Let's put it back. <laughs> I don't know, what is it? It's oh, not what you think like it is. spinach eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I need to talk to you about the birds and bees again, Mike. <laughs> oh, hang on. It smells smoky. Oh my God. It's so green. <laughs> it's drying my mouth, it's green. It's been scraped on the top of a, of a pond, isn't it? It's like oh. pond algae. It's Got the weirdest mouthfeel because it's almost like eating eggs. They're all popping. That is tonburi, otherwise known as land caviar. So you were kind of right with the whole kind of popping egg thing. Think a bit like caviar and roe, except it's from the grass. So it is the seed of a fruit of a grass. Would you like to try it in situ? Because probably on the end of a fork out of a bowl, isn't it? No, I'm going to stop eating yeah, it. Yeah, I'm going to stop it's eating it too. Weird. It's, it's weirdly Moorish. <laughs> Stunning. Okay, yeah. Quail egg and salmon blinis. 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 Right. So we, so we absolutely prepared something where traditional caviar might have a place and therefore we've used land caviar as a substitution. 
I didn't know I was eating it until the very end when it was popping and it was left in my mouth. In flavour, you've made it less of a Royale, more of a Florentine. In terms of it tastes like spinach at the end. Ah, mm. oh. interesting. So interestingly, a lot of restaurants are using it as a vegetarian or vegan alternative to caviar to make all sorts of canapes that might traditionally have caviar, which is obviously fish eggs, to give you that same pop and texture, which does add a dimension to food that is so unique. Yeah, but it's just got a completely different flavour profile. Yeah. yeah. So I get the pop, it's great, but why? Like, it, in my mind, that is not a direct no. replacement for caviar because it tastes completely different. But is it adding to the dish? No, no. I think the, I think the dish would taste delicious. You are adding another flavour, okay. mm. um, I would say, and, and another texture and experience. It's adding something different, but I'd prefer it without. So it's the summer cypress plant, which is an annual grass. The actual grass bit is what's used to make brooms. You know, the really stiff yeah. bristle brooms. That's the plant. What they do is take the fruit, boil the fruit, then they break it down and take out the seeds once it's chilled and peel them to get rid of the outer flesh. And then they dry it and then they inspect it. It's a very time consuming and labor intensive process. That jar is 170 grams. How much did we pay for it? I'm gonna say 20 pounds. I'm also going to say £20. I'm going to be honest, you're closer if you combine them. It's £35 for that jar, which makes it £205 per kilo. That's a hefty amount for something that actually probably deserves that price tag, but we're not made to appreciate it. So a very traditional preparation from the Akita region of Japan. There they've been eating it for a while, but it's definitely popping up in some of the world's top restaurants. The question is, pretentious or not. Having tasted it, realising that, personally, I don't think it's very nice, hearing the price tag, for that reason, I think it's pretentious. Probably in the ways in which it's being utilised outside of its native environment is pretentious. But as a product, it's not. Oh, split decision. Mike's sitting on the fence. I am. Barry's decided, and it sounds like neither of you are coming to a black tie do. Number four, boys, and I think it's fair to say we've come, we've come back into a comfort zone. Okay. Instantly looks like cheese. It smells and looks like little cubes of Edam. It doesn't come like that. The food team have cut that up. It's almost like a, a parmesan -y halloumi. Okay. okay. Actually, that's really nice. It tastes so sweet at the end. Does it not? Does, juicy. Is me? Juicy, juicy, juicy cheese. Juicy cheese. It, it tastes like one of those sort of paler, more milky cheeses. Cap Caccio Cavallo yeah. Podilico. Ooh. One of the noblest cheese varieties of southern Italy. Ah, oh, oh, yeah! Cool! Yeah. So it is a form of hung cheese. It tastes like that as well. <laughs> like, <laughs> like a snowman. Yeah. yeah. It is made with the milk of a particular and now relatively rare breed of cow, the Podilico. And those cows basically graze in one part of Italy, uh, in the Apennines. It's becoming increasingly difficult to produce dairy in that area. It's quite a fibrous, like spongy cheese. You can see from the texture when you bite into it. So it's a stretched curd cheese, which puts it in a similar vein in terms of production to something like provolone, or provolone, mm -hmm. which you will remember from things like Philly cheesesteak even. Mm. Does it melt well? Shall we find out? Oh, yes. Oh, oh yes. I'm this instantly is salivating. This is Barry. What am I about to eat? Fried Caccio Cavallo with roast mushrooms, shallots, an oregano. It's like a cross between mozzarella and halloumi when it's melted. Okay. Ooh, this is oh no, he's gone a cheese. Up. A cheese that can go both stretchy and crispy. When it's crispy, it's delicious. Boys, you've seen what the food team can do with it. What would you do with it? Where would you use this? Oh. Chicken palm. Oh. 100%. Oh, oh, oh. I'd keep it Italian. Um, <laughs> cheesy garlic bread. That also would work. Mm. Out straight out of a pizza oven, like a good char, good smoky. A bit basic for someone who's been on a cooking channel for 10 years. 
couple of other fun stories. It, the cheese gets its name, except for the Porlico bit, from a sort of a translation of two horses, because traditionally it's a hung cheese. They would literally hang up the cheese in pairs over the barn door, or over a beam or a gate, like you would tie up two horses. I thought you meant. I thought you were going to make yeah, a hung like a horse yeah, joke. Yeah. Oh no! Yeah. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't stoop that low. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing I find really interesting here is increasingly it's very difficult to support the production of this cheese because of climate change, very arid environments, that these cows are struggling to get the rich grass and stuff. So it's actually had support from the slow food movement, which we covered in a podcast a couple of years ago. It's almost like a living museum. So it gets the support and the recognition and the brand awareness to try and keep artisanal traditional foods alive. So for that cheese there, 720 grams worth, the kind of Olaf, how much? 40 pounds. Holy whoa. whoa. I'd say like, I'd say 25 pounds. Mike, you're closer. It is 35 pounds for that. I think it's 43 pounds per kilo. I love it. It's very expensive. Probably will never buy it, but I love it. Is it pretentious? Yes, but it shouldn't be. It is one of the best cheeses I've ever eaten and but it's still expensive no but the way i want to use it i will be pretentious <laughs> wonderful well that wraps up another episode over to you guys of those four items which if any do you think are pretentious comment down below let us know and make sure you give the video a like it will get buying some more potentially pretentious ingredients i'd love to see if the comments are polarizing hmm we have an app. It's called Meal Packs and helps you plan and then cook a week's worth of meals using one set of ingredients, saving you money, cutting down on food waste and answering the age-old question, what should we have for dinner? It's free to try for a whole month. The link is in the description box below. I mean, it's very unlikely you're going to get it unless you've heard of it. So we could put you out of your misery. Go on, I'm not miserable, Ebers. It's delicious. I'm having a nice time. Yeah, good point. You could put me out of my happiness as you do so regularly. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs>